You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I had somebody who's a friend of mine that doesn't follow baseball very closely, doesn't know very much about Jerry Reinsdorf, just kind of pays attention to the news. Ask me the other day, how do you feel about the fact that the White Sox are getting sold and moving to Nashville? And I could not stop laughing. Because those are the people, those are the people that actually believe the garbage that came out earlier this week. You know, like, I was driving the kids to school, and the morning mix guys were talking about the fact that, oh, he's going to sell the team, and he's probably moving to Nashville, or Dave Stewart's going to take it to Oakland, and it's, it's a rough day for White Sox fans. And I'm like, you can tell who isn't paying attention to this billionaire, because this is the biggest load of crap that he has put out since the last time he put out a big load of crap. This is all about trying to get the location at the 78 funded publicly and this is yet another Jerry Reinsdorf threat and it and it's just stupid isn't it the whole thing I mean it, it is it is just it's funny how everybody is is licking their chops I saw in the Tennessean they wrote an article about you know why it's viable that this could happen uh, and it's based around the idea that Jerry Reinsdorf is 88 years old and isn't going to own the team for very long and Dave Stewart has been pushing for a team in Nashville for a long time and and seems to have the funds to do it, but it's also not viable because they don't have a stadium there and it's going to have to be publicly funded in Nashville, which means either you know residents of Nashville or residents of that county or the state of Tennessee are going to have to fund it, and that's not a given. And also, Stewart's tried this before and failed, so why, why would he succeed now? So it, there's a lot of things that are like, okay, first of all, it's not a foregone conclusion, one that Jerry sells. It's not a foregone conclusion that Dave Stewart can buy. It's not a foregone conclusion that he could move the team to Nashville. And also, in Salt Lake City, uh, their newspaper was saying, well, wouldn't it be great if the White Sox came here because they're clearly going to be sold? And there's there's Cubs blogs that are like, it'll be a one-team town finally. What are we going to do? <laughs> and, and it's just like, guys, stop. He did this already. He did this once before when Tampa St. Pete had Tropicana Field which now has the, is the home of the Rays, had it ready to go. And he said, well, I'll move the White Sox down there unless you you publicly fund my stadium. We got guaranteed rate field. It's been under lease to the White Sox for all these years. And yeah, he's, he's, he's just stuck in the past. We've talked about him being stuck in the past in terms of how he runs the organization. Well, this is how he's trying to bully J.B. Pritzker into giving him money. But it's not going to work because here's the no. thing. All you have to do, the moment this story came out and I read it and, and listen, uh, Britt Giroli is an, uh, an incredible journalist. Her and Ken Rosenthal put together that story just a few weeks back for The Athletic, uh, where she had all those sources. This is what's going on in the organization, and here's the dysfunction. And Ken Rosenthal has already come out and said, like, I believe it because she wrote it, and she clearly has sources within the organization. So I believe it. I believe that it's been floated that he could sell the team. But he's floating it. See, and that's the thing. If you if you if you've watched Jerry Reinsdorf over the years, you understand this is Jerry using the same outlet that embarrassed him a few weeks ago now to his advantage. He's a billionaire playing a game. My first reaction to reading it was if he truly was selling the team, it would be an open sale and there'd be more than just one group involved. It's really funny that the only group involved goes back to this Nashville threat, which he's already used so many times, right? He went and visited the mayor. He tried to make it look like he was negotiating moving down there. And the mayor tells the press, yeah, we were just having lunch. I mean, we're not talking about any of that stuff. Like, that's crazy. We're, we're, we're not even in a position to have a baseball team. And it made him look stupid, right? So then he came back after he couldn't get any public funding. And he goes, well, if I die, then my son would sell the team. And he'd probably sell it to somebody who would move it. And then he would probably leave. And everybody laughed at him because that was the most absurd thing in the world. Like, why would you move a team out of this market when there's so much that's available to you? where you have this passionate fan base and you have the ability to grow if you just ran it properly. But now you're sitting there trying to convince me that a man who held on to this team for all this time, a, a miser, a guy who wants to maximize his profits, 
he is going to sell this team and he's only interested in one buyer? If he really was trying to sell the team, it'd be a bidding war. There'd be multiple groups involved. There might be one that wants to move it. There might be two that want to keep it here. And, and, and it would not just be one group. It's convenient that the group that it's leaked that he's talking to is a group that has talked about getting a team in Oakland or getting a team in Nashville because then it makes you assume that upon sale it would be moved. But if you actually read the article, there's nothing in there that says that that's what Dave Stewart would do in the first place. This is smoke and mirrors and innuendo and trying to just get under your skin. And the other reason he won't, he won't do this is because in interview after interview after interview, he has always said that upon his death, he has told his children to sell the White Sox. And why is it upon his death? Because of the capital gains tax. He is going to lose a boatload selling right. now. I'm telling you right now, this is what this man cares about. He cares about nothing but money. He thinks he can take it with him in the hearse to the graveyard. He thinks about his legacy and leaving his, you know, leaving the next generations behind him as much money as possible. He is not giving that money up and losing it in a sale before he dies. He's not doing it. And you, all you have to do, that's the problem. The internet kills Jerry Reinsdorf because the internet keeps records of everything he's ever said. And I don't think he gets that. So all you have to do is look back at things that he said before and understand this goes completely against all of the, the business know-how and the way that he has explained this in the past. He's not selling before he dies. And if he was selling, he'd be trying to maximize his profit and not just talking to a former baseball player who's got to have a bunch of investors behind him and they got to pool their money and there's a limit to what they can spend. So that's, that at, it, at its core is why I don't buy it. Then I can also look at the fact this is the same thing as, as, the, as the Tampa threat Back in the late '80s, it's the this is the exact same gambit, well, right? This is just he's just using another. He's using somebody else. This is the exact same gambit, and so I don't doubt that the athletic was told what they were told. I don't doubt that it's been presented to them. But here's where out of town stupid comes in. If you're somebody who hasn't passionately watched this team and understands this owner, you fall for this. But if you're around it all the time. If you read every article and every quote that has ever come out of this man's mouth and you remember it because you're so passionate about this team, you know this is a load of crap. It's, it, it, it's actually a funny, desperate load of crap that is not going to go anywhere because the only people it's fooling are people like who I talked about right at the beginning of the show. Somebody who doesn't really watch baseball, doesn't know very much about it, saw an article, heard a rumor, somebody said it on the radio in the morning. And was like, oh, he's selling the team and they're moving to Nashville. Those are the only people buying this. Well, like you, you picked up on, a, on an interesting thread there when you were, to, were talking about the capital gains. You're talking about the tax ramifications of a sale. Remember, he bought this thing 40 plus years ago for far less than this team is worth. Far less than any major league baseball team is going to sell for in 2024, 2025. I, for one, do not doubt Dave Stewart contacted Jerry Reinsdorf and said, Jerry, I understand you might want to, you know, your family might sell the team at some point in the near future. You're trying to get out of your stadium deal and trying to do something else. I could alleviate a lot of your problems because I could buy the team from you. And I'm sure Dave Stewart is looking at the twins who are going to be up for sale at some point in the near future because they've already announced that the Polad family is pulling out of there. So Stewart is definitely looking at any opportunity he can. I guarantee you Jerry is at least smart enough to sit there and say, okay, Dave, what do you got? Because you don't, you don't ever turn away somebody who wants to buy something that you have of tremendous value like that. The tax ramifications aside, you don't stop the conversation right there, then and there. You'd love to sit there and say, you know, you have an owner that loves his team so much that he would never, ever can, you know, consider a sale, but we literally spent the entire year as fans telling Jerry to sell the team. So when he he's you know listening to at least an overture, and again, I think that that's legit that he's listening to an overture. It it shouldn't shock anybody that he's he's paying attention to what Dave Stewart's selling. But everybody started to connect the dots far too quickly. Stewart's been trying to get a team in Nashville. Yeah, that's true. Stewart tried to buy the Oakland Coliseum, or at least tried to get an Oakland A's deal and, and buy it from John Fisher. That's true. He's an A's legend, right? So it makes perfect sense that he would go and do that in Oakland. Does it necessarily mean it's going to happen? No. And is Jerry really prepared to 
sell the team right now at a fairly low value because his media is unestablished, okay? The the, the new Chicago Sports Network is an unestablished. It, it doesn't have any history of making money. He is in flux with the stadium. He doesn't own the 78. If he owned the 78 and said this is a buildable site, that's something. But he doesn't own the 78 at this point. He is trying to get the funds together, even though he has it. He could do it. But he's trying to get public funding to make that a reality. Think about what he's actually doing. I mean, you're, you're touching on it here. And so I just want to drive right into this point. He's trying to get to the 78 to increase the value of the team before he dies. Exactly. So that when his son sells it, he makes more money. So now what you're trying to tell me is he's just going to give up. This guy's just going to give up and leave all that money on the table for this thing. Sox in the Basement listeners switch to a new age of life with high at home medical equipment. Keep mom and dad, gram and grandpa out of assisted living. Make it so they can get around on their own and live independently with stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, and even bathroom remodeling. They're going to work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals. If you use a CPAP machine and you're unhappy with your vendor, switch now, get supplies directly mailed to you. And High at Home Medical Equipment has the latest and greatest in continuous glucose monitors. See everything that Hyatt has to offer at HHME.com. This is the perfect time for this. Think about this. you got the playoffs going on. You've got a lot of reporters and people out there that are looking for content. You, you can only write so many lines about the game the night before in the NLCS or the ALCS. That's, there's only so much. So you need other stories in baseball. He's aware of this. And this is one that's got some meat to it. People are going to take it and they're going to run with it. They're going to talk about all the possibilities. They're going to look back at what Dave Stewart says. And, and when you get like no comment from both of them, that gives you the ability to just go wild with your imagination and write, write stories on this thing and get content and get clicks. And that's what this is all about. He knows that. He knows he's putting something out there. The one thing that came out that I never knew, Ed, yeah, I, I never knew was the percentage of the team he actually owns. Right. Ken Rosenthal reported it. Because in the middle of their reporting of this, they put out that he only owns 19% of the team. Isn't that crazy? So you're telling me that he has to convince the other owners to go with him because he only has 19% of the votes for a sale. Yeah, that's, that's I mean... Right. I mean, isn't that, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, look, I'm just a, a humble business owner, but I incorporated my company and I remember my tax guy explaining to me how shares work and percentage of my company. If I decided to give anything to anybody and I'm pretty sure that if all the other owners said, we don't want to accept this price, he can't force it through. Cause he only owns a fifth of the team. He has the majority ownership, but he has to convince all these other people. This is maximizing their profit. And so you're going to convince them to take the capital gains tax too. You're going to convince them to leave money on the table too. Again, another reason why this is far-fetched. I mean, go to the White Sox website, look up the front office page. It's Jerry Reinsdorf as the chairman because he's got 19%. But Robert Judelson's on that board. He's got a vote. Judd Melkin's on that board. Alan Munchen's on that board. Jay Pinsky's on that board. Lee Stern's on that board. Burton Urie is on that board. And he's only got 19%. That's that, that's the other thing, too, that I think people tend to forget because Jerry's the face of the franchise, right? And he's he's the the majority owner, but we don't know what that means until you, you spell out the numbers like that and you sit there and go, oh, only 19%. It's a corporation that owns the White Sox, okay? It, it, it's not Jerry Reinsdorf. It's not the Reinsdorf family that owns the White Sox. Let's say for the sake of argument that Jerry's going to look at this and go, well, Mr. Stewart, you know, admired your pitching back in the day. You know, you're you're fearsome and amazing, and I really liked watching your World Series teams and all that stuff, and I'd be willing to sell my 19% to you, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean, one, that he can do that from a corporate standpoint. There's got to be a vote on it that, that Dave Stewart comes in. And then Dave Stewart doesn't own the majority either. And, and that's the other part of this is that if there's other owners involved, if there's other shareholders involved in the corporation, corporations have to do things by vote. They are little democracies, okay? They're very, very rarely, you know, autocratic dictatorships. I mean, 
your corporation here with this show, I mean, yes, you are dictator for life because you don't have any actual shareholders. Yeah, I didn't I'm, give anybody any shares. I held the whole thing. So I get to make I get to make all the decisions. And yeah, he can he can sell just his 19% to Dave Stewart. They could become majority owners, but they're like it, like cha- moving the team from one place to another, they're going to need a vote on that. Even if even if he just sold his por- portion. He goes, "Well, you guys don't want to approve selling more than my 19%, so I'm going to get out. My 19%s out. Reinsdorf out." And he walks out the door. Dave Stewart walks in. He goes, I have, I have the majority ownership. They go, great. He goes, I want to move the thing to Nashville. And they go, why would we do that? We're going to lose money on that deal. Yeah. 81% of us sit there and say, we're not doing this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like Lee, let me tell you something. Lee Stern, uh, Lee Stern. I have, I have somebody who I, I know who has met and spoken with him on several different occasions. Okay. Lee Stern is a Chicago guy, loves the White Sox. I, I guarantee you that guy on the board isn't voting to move the team. And I, I doubt he's not. He's the only one. It's about money. These guys invested a ton of money in this team. They're going to do what they think is fiscally responsible. Dave Stewart isn't taking 19% walking in and going, hey, I'm the new boss and I want to move. And they're all going to go, OK, here's our votes. They're not doing that. Yeah, no. Dave Stewart, as a 19% shareholder, can, I mean, he can stand there and be intimidating because that's what Dave Stewart did when he was on the mound. You know, he can stare a hole through you and throw a fastball through you, but... Uh, that doesn't work in the boardroom. I mean, and there's no there's no guarantee that just because Dave Stewart would be, let's stop using the word majority shareholder for a second. Dave Stewart would have the largest proportionate share of the team doesn't necessarily make him the chairman of the board either. Okay, that's also something that gets voted on. It just so happens, I think that they've done that for Jerry because Jerry's been the loudest voice in the room and he's been the public face of the franchise since he he and Eddie Einhorn purchased it. It's been Jerry all along, but at this point, that's almost a figurehead type of a thing, I'm sure. And I'm sure Jerry still does make active shot calling and all that. So I, th- I think everything we've heard about this is absolutely true, the way Jerry operates. But when it comes to a major thing like that, one, selling the entirety of the team, that's a lot of voices and a lot of people that have their hands in the pot that need to vote this in and agree 100% on this. That That's the type of thing you don't do with majority rules, okay? And, and I don't know their corporate paperwork, but I've, I've been a lawyer long enough to know that that generally speaking, when you're in this kind of a situation, this kind of a high money, high leverage situation, you make it as restrictive as possible to sell your shares. You make it as restrictive as possible to sell the entire corporation out. It's got to be... Usually, for most people, in smaller potato situations, it's got to be something where everybody is absolutely 100% on board. There's also nothing that says that the chairman of the board controls where the team goes, okay? And that the chairman of the board gets to make authoritarian decisions where they can do whatever they want. Unless he wrote it in when they all bought their shares, but who gets in on that? But nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to do that if it's going to potentially cost them the bottom line. Moving the team is a major deal because, again, they just invested money in Chicago Sports Network. Well, guess what you don't need anymore if you go to Nashville? You don't, you don't need a TV station in Chicago. And now you got to deal with whatever your partnership agreement is with the Wirtz family. you got to deal with that. Um, and, yes, Reinsdorf's do own the Bulls still, but that's, that's still – the White Sox have skin in that game and they're going to lose out on it because they don't get a chance to make any of that money back if they move right now. The stadium thing is a very real thing. 2029 comes up. The lease for guaranteed rate field comes up. They got to make a decision. Are they going to stay there, renew the lease? Are they going to buy that property from the state? What are they going to do? Okay. They got to figure out what they're going to do in the next four to five years for a stadium. The 78 is obviously still in play, but He's got to answer one simple question. That entire board's got to answer one simple question in the state of Illinois. What's in it for us if we give you money? And they haven't been able to answer that. And and they got to answer that to Tennessee and to Nashville as well. And they'd have to answer that to Oakland. You know, that county in California could have swept in and tried to do something for the Fishers. But it sounds like the owner there just didn't want to do it. He wants to move to Vegas, right? That That was just his goal. So look, if Jerry and the White Sox want to move, if that corporation wants to move, over the next five years, they will find a way to make that happen. If they don't want to move, like you said, if you've got board members who are sitting there going, I'm a Chicago guy, this is history, this is my team, this is where this team belongs forever and ever until Major League Baseball folds and it's no longer a thing, the White Sox belong on the south side of Chicago, which I think if you pulled everybody in Major League Baseball who's ever been a part of Major League Baseball – 
anybody in in the commissioner's office, owners across the the states, they'd all sit there and go, yeah, it'd be really, really weird for the White Sox to not be on the south side of Chicago. Just as weird as it would be for the Yankees to be in in Utah. No, if he moved the team, I, I still believe that if at some point he moved the team, we would get another team. Like the Rays would be here and they'd be called the White Sox. Or it'd be yeah. or or this would be part of like one of those expansion things. Like this would be similar to the Browns leaving and going to Baltimore, but the Browns name stayed with Cleveland. And so the the sure the Browns became the Ravens and moved to Baltimore, but the Browns name stayed there and they were replaced with a different team. Well, and, and most teams when they move, most teams when they move are, are are have a name change. The Montreal Expos are are now the Washington Nationals. Okay. The Texas Rangers were the Washington Senators. The Tennessee Titans were the Houston Oilers. You're right. So I mean, like that. That's the other thing. Look, I, 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 I listen to this this garbage in this way that he's pushing this, and I, I think that I have the same reaction as most White Sox fans. I think you have the same reaction as me. Do it, then. I dare you. Like I, I mean, this is such a it's such a weird time because we we are all so angry at this team. Like there is probably about ten to fifteen percent of White Sox fans that were heavily affected by this stupid rumor and actually believed. Oh my God, they're going to move my team. But I think the majority of people are like, all right, can we just do something? Like, I would rather he died, but if he's not going to die and he's going to move it, all right, then maybe Major League Baseball will give us a better organization or maybe the new owner will come in. I mean, there's nothing in there that says that Dave Stewart really wants to move the team. In fact, if you actually look at it, he wanted a Nashville expansion team. And when it didn't work out, he wanted to be part of the A's. He just wants to be an owner. Like, that's the thing that's really funny. Like, everybody's yeah, just assuming. Just wants to own a baseball yeah, team. Everybody's assuming he wants a team so he can put it someplace where he wants to live. He doesn't want to do that. He just wants to be an owner. I mean, Tom Brady just bought a portion of the Raiders. He has no connection to the Raiders, but it was available to him. And he's like, next stage of my life, I want to be an owner in professional sports. So he goes and he buys a portion of a team that's available. He just wants to get into the club. He wants to be part of the owner's club. If there was no football team available, he might have picked a basketball team or a baseball team or a hockey team. You, you actually see that, too. You'll see you'll see oh, baseball yeah. players get in on a different sport. Ownership is the next level. It's where they're going to put their millions and millions that they earned because now they can get it turned into billions. That's what they want to do. It's smart. So just assuming that let's say that he really does want to buy. Let's say he has the money to do so. Let's say he has the right backers to do so. And let's say Jerry Reinsdorf is going to make a bad financial decision and sell. There's nothing out there right now that indicates that it matters to Dave Stewart if he's in Nashville or on the south side of Chicago. Nothing. There's nothing. No. You scan that story again. There's nothing that indicates that. All of this is conjecture and worry and hand wringing. And you want to know who loves that? Jerry Reinsdorf loves that. He's sitting in his, in his, in his office right now, smoking a cigar with the shades drawn, like the evil owner in the natural, cackling to himself because he's stirred up the masses over this. And I'm telling you right now, there's nothing to be stirred up about. Yeah, he, he stirred it up. He made the White Sox relevant during playoff baseball when they're they're completely irrelevant to the point where more people are talking about that than are talking about the fact that the Dodgers are about to move on or, you know, the Yankees getting stunned with a ninth inning home run the other day. I, Listen, you know, the Dodgers not, are winning the World Series. I know, it, right? Yeah. Uh, that whatever Here happened, we go again. They, like, that Padres series got it just turned on a switch, and they, they just woke up and realized that they were the best team on paper, so they might as well be the best team in the league. That, that's what happened. Right, exactly. And, and, and so we're, what are we doing, though? We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the Dodgers as the new evil empire or anything along those lines. No, we're, we're sitting here, I'm literally, as I'm sitting here scrolling through stuff, like I said, I'm, I'm looking at Salt Lake City going, but what if Dave Stewart comes here instead of Nashville? What, what, <laughs> yeah, what if? I mean, there's a lot of towns. There's a lot of towns that he could take the White Sox to. Right now, there's a guy in Reno, Nevada, writing a story saying, what if they came to Reno? We 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 are a big time town. We have the, we have the international bowling championships here. All right, we, exactly. We deserve a baseball team. People would drive from Sacramento and the Lake Tahoe area to come to Reno, Nevada to watch the Reno White Sox. That article's probably being written right now. Everybody believes that they could have a team. Yeah, let's go talk to any major city that doesn't have a team, okay? Let's let's go talk to Charlotte, shall we? I mean, yes, they have the White Sox AAA team, but why not have the big club, you know? Right, right. The Bakersfield White Sox. Santa Fe, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Let's, <laughs> the, uh, we- the Wheeling, West Virginia White Sox. That's got a ring to it. Well, these are just places you've lived. <laughs> 
<laughs> Rochester, New York, White Sox. Here, we'll throw that one in there for you. There you go. Me. You did radio there. Let's just pick all the towns. Because guess what? Every single one of those people, every single one of those towns think they deserve a baseball team. It doesn't Now, in terms of towns one. I've lived in, in terms of towns I've lived in that the White Sox could legitimately move to, the Arlington Heights White Sox could actually happen because, you know, the Bears have a, <laughs> have a big plot of land that they want to sell now, I think. <laughs> It is now time for the Sox nerd, Dave Marin, the guy that puts up all those tidbits on the scoreboard during the year at the rate, and he brings his knowledge, his trivia, and things you may not have known to Sox in the Basement each and every week, and he's brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore. It is perfect for a day trip, and all of the information for everything they're doing is available at lamontdowntown.com. Nerd, what do you got for me today? Chris, with the Yankees still alive in the playoffs, I thought I'd throw out a few nuggets and memories on the Sox and the Bronx Bombers. In 2024, Gavin Sheets' 947 slugging percentage was the highest ever by a White Sox lefty with at least 19 at-bats against the Yankees. In addition... Sheets' 526 average against the Yankees in 2024 was the third highest in Sox history behind Lamar Johnson's 632 in 1977 and Red Barnes's 546 in 1930. The Sox are 835 and 1,086 all-time against the Yankees. The 435 winning percentage is the Sox' lowest among foes they played at least 30 times. The Sox dropped 4 of 5 to the Yankees this season after going 4 and 2 against them in 2023. The Sox have not had a winning record against the Yanks in consecutive seasons since 1994 and 1995. The Sox all-time home run leader against the Yankees is Paul Konerko with 23, while Luke Appling's 304 hits and 146 RBIs are the Sox's best efforts against the Bombers. You know who was really good against the Yankees? John Crook. In his only year with the Sox, the Bills legend hit 533 with two homers, the only ones he would hit with the Sox, and eight RBI in five games against the Yankees in 1995. The final home run of Kruk's career, which was his 100th, was a first-inning grand slam in the Sox 11-5 win over the Yankees on turn-back-the-clock night before 42,000-plus on the south side. That came two nights after Kruk victimized Jack McDowell with a three-run homer in the first inning. McDowell, incidentally, earned the nickname the Yankee Flipper two weeks later when he flipped off a booing Yankee Stadium crowd after being KO'd by the Sox in the second game of of a doubleheader. Not surprisingly, Babe Ruth is the Yankees' all-time leader with 94 home runs against the White Sox, but his most interesting moment against the Southsiders may have come in the aftermath of a July 9, 1921 game between the teams. In the next day's New York Times, Ruth was taken to task for not bunting when the Yankees had runners on base in the 15th inning of a Sox win. My favorite Sox-Yankees game came on August 21, 2005, at then-named U.S. Cellular Field. On that day, the flailing Sox snapped a seven-game skid in which they had been outscored 42-20. to The Sox clubbed four home runs off the big unit, Randy Johnson, in the fourth inning en route to a rousing 6-2 to win. When reserve catcher Chris Widger capped the fourth with a three-run bomb off a pitch in his eyes, I knew 2005 was not going to be a typical Sox season. Two months and five days later, I was proven right when the Sox won it all. Before I get to my zinger, a reminder, you can access my blog at SoxInTheBasement.com, and there is plenty of Sox nerd material on Twitter. My zinger, Robin Ventura, a player not strongly associated with the Yankees, hit the most homers, 206, while playing for both the Sox and the Yankees. In addition, Robin is the last player to represent both franchises at the All-Star Game. That's it, Chris. More than you probably wanted to know about the Sox, Yankees, Pauly, and the Witch. Uh, You know, here's the thing. I think that the reason it gets played... And I think the reason that that we even talked about it today, one, it's a little interesting. Two, it's kind of fun to point out the ridiculousness of what Jerry Reinsdorf's trying to do with this. 
it also gave me a little hope. Because any move that would remove Jerry Reinsdorf gives me hope. Like right now, if somebody sat there and said, you don't know if Dave Stewart's going to move the team or not. But I can guarantee you that Jerry Reinsdorf will be out and there'll be new people in charge of the team and they're going to do business differently. I'd roll the dice on whether or not they moved or not. I would. I'd be like, okay, give me that. Oh, yeah. yeah but I can't guarantee they're going to stay. I don't care. Give me that. I take anything to get that guy out of there. Anything. Anybody who comes in, anybody who comes in new is going to modernize the team, is going to want to bring it into this century, is going to want to turn it into what it should be, which is a powerhouse in the AL Central, a a team that belongs to the third largest media market, a team that has a rich history, a dedicated, passionate fan base, has all, there's a lot to give to the White Sox. New ownership always wants to win. Because they, yeah. need to, they need to they increase need the value it. of what they just purchased. And they've used all their money to get in there. So they need to make money now. So new ownership wants to win. In any sport, whenever they buy a new team, new ownership generally wants to win. So any sale would be an improvement on the franchise. So again, I'd, I'd roll the dice. I, I, it'd be great. You're not scaring me with they may sell. You're not, you're not scaring me. You're, you, you've piqued my interest. I'm like, ooh, let's see what happens. I just don't think it's real. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.